Hey, welcome uh, to this History on Tap. My name is Jeremy Smith. I'm with the Los Alamos Creative District. And just want to give you a heads up on some other on taps. Next month, we have the Culture on Tap. And in uh, November will be the final Nature on Tap of the year. Um, so check out the website, creativelosalamos.com to see um, who we're going to host and um, the exact dates on those. They may be a little bit in flux um, with some of the holiday schedule coming up, but uh, follow us. And you can also sign up for the newsletter for all of the ONTAPs uh, at the creativelosalamos.com website. We also have Evening of Arts and Culture happening October 22nd. Um, we're partnering with the Arts Council on that. Uh, we'll have a number of locations in the downtown area, lots of performances, music, poetry, dance, um, singing um, happening, uh, Fuller Lodge, the library, um, the Art Center will also be having their um, pottery studio open and be selling some of their items. So that'll be a fun addition to the evening. Um, so once again, evening of arts and culture, October 22nd, um, and it will extend all the way down to Bathtub Row Brewing over to Bosey Brothers. So um, definitely put that on your calendar. It is a Friday evening from six to about 10 p.m. And of course, Halloween's coming up uh, next month. Uh, so that's October 29th and 30th, uh, the usual trick or treat on Main Street. Pumpkin Glow, the Scarecrow Contest, uh, all of those will be happening this year, um, and all of those also outside. So uh, take a look at the, the website, creativelosalamos.com, to see the schedule. And um, that's all I have. Uh, Amy, thanks. Uh, thanks for co-hosting this, and back to you. I'm looking forward to this evening's discussion. Awesome. Thanks, Jeremy. So much, so much fun stuff coming up from the Creative District. There it is, yes. <laughs> It's always fun to do on tap with you too. Um, I've, so I've got the funnest job there is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Amy. Um, I'm the museum educator for the Los Alamos History Museum. I'm super excited to welcome all of you to History on Tap tonight. Thank you for joining us online. Um, if you are here live, um, we're recording this and you'll get the recording emailed out to you. So if you wanted to rewatch it or share it with anybody, uh, we should have it up on our YouTube page, um, hopefully before the end of the week. Um, and you are very welcome um, to put on your video if you would like to. We've got everybody muted by default, um, but if you wanted to, you know, see who else is here and sort of be in a more uh, communal environment, you're very welcome to put your video on. Um, and we'll be taking, um, you know, uh, History on Tap has a lot to do with uh, discussion and conversation. We'll do that in the chat. Um, so depending on the device that you're on, you should be able to find the chat for Zoom at the bottom of the screen, at the top of the screen, perhaps a button on the side if you're using a mobile device. Um, if you're new to trying that out, maybe take a moment now to find chat and say hi to everybody uh, in the chat because that's what we'll do the Q&A. Uh, once we get to the, the end of a, you know, a brief intro uh, to the topic tonight, and the topic tonight is a brief history of the Bias Caldera National Preserve. Um, and we have Coco Ray uh, to present that. She's a longtime uh, volunteer at the preserve and also an author. Um, so it should be a really interesting presentation with some, some cool photos. So I'll pass that off to you. Thanks very much, Amy. Um, thanks everybody for joining us tonight. Um, I'm just gonna give a brief overview of the history of the Bay, as Amy mentioned. Um, Obviously, because it's uh, we're talking about geologic history as well, it goes back quite a ways. So um, I'll touch on sort of the highlights, um, and then uh, of course, you know, we can have our conversation with questions at the end. Um, so I am going to go ahead and share my screen, and hopefully, everybody is going to be able to see that. And then, Amy, can you just give me a heads up that that looks okay? Looks good to me. And okay. Anybody awesome. else? Oh. I don't I should have said too, if anybody um, wants to and you can't see it well, you can put on speaker view uh, in Zoom, but especially when we're screen sharing, you should be able to see it great. Okay, awesome. So anyway, so we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, history of the Valle. Um, and as I said, we'll start with the geology because after all, there wouldn't be a Valle if we didn't have the geologic history. Um, the reason that the Valle is where it is uh, and that we even have the Jemez Mountains has to do with two major geologic features of the Southwest. 
One is called the Hamid Lineament, uh, and that runs southwest to northwest, or northeast, excuse me, across uh, the state of New Mexico, stretching actually all the way down into the White Mountains in Arizona, and then all the way up to where Capulin Mountain is located in the northeast corner of the state. Um, and then there's a north-south geologic feature, the Rio Grande Rift, which of course the Rio Grande runs down. And those two features um, cross effectively where the Hamas Mountains are located. And so it's been, you know, historically an area of great geologic activity and it helps explain why we have so much volcanic activity in New Mexico, particularly on uh, west of the Rio Grande uh, as part of the lineament. Um, and so uh, the, the Hamas Mountains were formed as a result of this geologic activity. Um, and for those of you who don't know, um, very basic explanation of a caldera. I should say I am not a geologist, but this is a very basic explanation. Caldera is formed when magma uh, rises up from below the Earth's crust, increasing pressures eventually erupt, um, is a volcano as we know it, um, scattering debris everywhere. Uh, and then when the pressure has been released, the remaining material collapses back down lower than the original surface. And that's what creates the caldera, um, which in Spanish just means cauldron, or you can think of it as a bowl. Um, I like to think of it sort of as a magma filled souffle. It's effectively the same kind of um, activity happening. Um, and so the caldera is actually is a, is a particularly important one because it's our caldera here in the Hamas Mountains um, that is used to define all calderas worldwide because it's such an excellent example of what's called a resurgent caldera because there was a second um, eruption after the first one. This is also why the caldera is not perfectly circular. Um, so the first caldera that was formed was about 1.6 million years ago. Um, that was the Toledo caldera. Um, and that one was about nine miles in diameter and it released more than 85 cubic miles of debris. Um, some of it reached as far as Kansas. Um, and the, some of the uh, ash deposits um, we can see in and around Los Alamos, particularly in the bandolier area, what's known as lower bandolier tuff. And so it's the lower layers of, um, of ash from that initial eruption. Um, shortly, well, shortly in geologic terms, about 400,000 years after the first caldera was formed, we get the first lava dome. If, it, if you can see my arrow, which is uh, Rabbit Mountain, sort of roughly in this area along the South Rim, um, right along Highway 4. Those of you who have hiked Rabbit Ridge and Coyote Call Trails, that's going right up uh, Rabbit, Ridge, uh, Rabbit Mountain. Um, and a lava dome is just kind of what we think of as a classic volcano, where the magma pushes up, erupts, and then gradually hardens, leaving the dome behind. Um, and so there was consistent uh, volcanic activity for you know, hundreds of thousands of years after that. Um, and the current caldera, as we have it now, was formed about 1.25 million years ago. Um, and this was about, tw it's about 12 to 15 miles in diameter now, depending on where you measure it because I said it's somewhat oval, and that's because it largely obliterated the first eruption, but not completely. And so that's why we don't get the perfect circle. This eruption, while we have sort of a bigger uh, ultimate caldera, it actually had a little bit less in terms of debris. It was about 75 cubic miles of debris. Um, and just for comparison's sake, Mount St. Helens, which many of us remember, um, only had 0 0.7 cubic miles of debris. Um, so you can get a sense of just how massive these eruptions were. Although I should say this is not a super volcano. A lot of people think that it is absolutely not. Super volcano is 240 cubic miles or more, which is a lot. This would still be enough to wipe out, you know, most of the Southwest, um, but it's definitely not on the super volcano sc uh, um, scale. Upper Bandelier Tuff, which is the, the eruption of the caldera that we have now, we can also see in Bandelier, that's the upper layer of ash. Um, this did also scatter about as far as the Mississippi. Um, and it's after this eruption that forms the caldera as we have it now, that we get additional eruptions. And one of the first ones uh, forms Redondo Mountain, which is the largest of um, the peaks in the preserve. It's also the highest, it's about 11,200 feet. Um, and the thing that makes it special is it's, it's actually a resurgent dome, which means the magma pushed the land up but it didn't actually burst. Um, and so that's really unique. It's the only one in the preserve that is a resurgent dome. All of the others were actual lava domes. So we had later eruptions after that. And Redondo happened about 30,000 years after the eruption that created the caldera as we have it now. 
and it it rose incredibly fast. It's about an inch a year. Um, and Fraser Goff, who's one of the, the leading geologists of the preserve, has said that if people had been living in the area at the time, you would actually notice it was move, it was rising up that that quickly, which is kind of cool if you think about it. Um, and then after uh, after Redondo was formed, we get later eruptions, roughly counterclockwise, starting with Cerro del Medio and working their way around, many of which were in the last half million years. Um, and then we end up with little Cerro La Jara, which is real close to the current visitor center, South Mountain. And then the most recent is the Banco Bonito lava flow. And that was only about 40,000 years ago. Um, and so what that means is while we are no longer active, we are not extinct, we are dormant. Um, and so um, there is still a fair amount of geologic activity or volcanic activity going on in the area. Now, Geologists are not worried about it exploding anytime soon like they are about Yellowstone, but there are still there is still active stuff to be seen, um, particularly on the western side of the preserve. Um, on, in, in the area known as Sulphur Canyon or Sulphur Springs, um, there's a lot of fumaroles. If you go hiking up Alamo Canyon or Sulphur Canyon in the preserve on the western side, you can see those all over the place. Lots of mud pots, um, which are also very cool um, to see. Those are bubbling away. Um, there's geothermal ponds on the western side of the preserve. Um, and then, of course, there's also San Antonio Hot Springs just outside the boundary of the, of the preserve, which are, of course, a result of the activity here. And then Macaulay, Spence, Hamas Springs, all of that um, in that part of the Hamas are a result of what's going on. So we still have activity. We're just not erupting anytime soon. Um, and so uh, one of the things, just before I move on, that um, people often ask about um, the caldera is, you know, well, why are there no trees on in all of the valleys? The valleys, of course, were defined by, or were sort of delimited by the eruptions of the lava domes that give us the mountains we have now. Um, and people say, you know, was it because of overgrazing or too much logging? Um, and it actually has to do with the geology and the volcanology. Um, there were at least four points in geologic history where there was no outflow in the preserve. And so there are underground sp uh, springs, you know, that's how we get um, mud pots and hot springs, um, and they didn't have anywhere to go. And that combined with rain over thousands of years created lakes. Um, and the sediment goes down almost 300 feet and the mineral content and the density of it is so great that it's not conducive to the types of trees that grow at that elevation, particularly Aspen and Douglas fir. Um, and so that's one reason why there's no trees. And the other reason is that because it's a bowl, it acts as a cold sink. And so down in the valleys, there are too many days below freezing to allow seedlings to take root. And so what's cool, one of the many things that's cool about it is that there's never gonna be trees there. It's an inverse tree line. And as far as I know, it's a really unique uh, phenomenon. You don't see that very often. Um, and so those are naturally occurring valleys because of those two um, phenomena. Um, and we think that the, the, you know, the pristine grasslands and then, of course, the, you know, the uh, year round streams are one of the reasons that attracted Native Americans to the area. Um, you can't talk about the Valles Caldera without talking about the uh, indigenous tradition. People have been coming to this area as long as people have been in the Southwest. Um, it, there's, there's any number of things to attract people there. Um, certainly, um, as I said, you know, the, the grasslands, um, we know of at least 350 different species of plants that have been used and are still used for medicinal and ritual purposes by Native Americans in the region. Um, certainly hunting was, you know, uh, and to this day is still uh, excellent. Uh, and so that was also an attraction. Um, and so for all of the Native peoples of the Southwest, Pueblo, Apache, uh, you know, Utes, uh, and even further uh, afield, the Valles Caldera and the mountains within it figure very, very large in their uh, oral traditions and histories. Any Native community that has had any ties to the Southwest has some kind of connection to um, the Valles Caldera. Hamas Pueblo and Zia Pueblo in particular, but as I say, that extends to almost everybody who's had some kind of interaction in the, in the Southwest. 
Um, and in particular, Redondo Peak, which as I said, is the highest peak in the preserve, is really sacred to all of the tribes. It figures, as I said, the, apart from the preserve itself, the peak it figures very largely in people's oral traditions. Um, it's considered except, exceptionally sacred to this day, uh, and non-tribal members are asked not to try to summit the peak because it is it is so important to the um, indigenous peoples of the Southwest. Um, and so, uh, as I said, people have been coming here as, as long as we know that people have been in the Southwest, at least 12,000 years. Um, they appear to have made seasonal camps, um, largely in the summer season, um, which was very brief. Um, you know, as, as recently as the 1950s, the passes would be closed uh, with snow um, as late as June and as early as late October. Um, so it was very seasonal presence, um, uh, but uh, they were attracted, as I said, because of the, the um, plants for medicinal and ritual purposes, for hunting, but also for other resources, in particular the obsidian. Um, the obsidian uh, in uh, the caldera is some of the finest in all of North America, and we have found um, uh, obsidian from the caldera as far east as Kansas, uh, and as far south as Mexico, uh, and then up to North Dakota and into Canada. And so we know that this was traded far and wide. There are many, many sites throughout the preserve um, that are what are called lithic scatter sites, where, which were production sites for producing um, obsidian tools um, and then you know, taking them out at the end of the season and using them for trade purposes elsewhere. Um, if you know what you're looking for, you can find them all the time um, when you're out hiking or, or um, exploring in the preserve. Uh, this picture on the left is a really nice obsidian scraper. It's one of the nicest pieces I've ever found. Um, I should say everything in the preserve is protected. So if you find it, take a picture and then leave it where it is. You cannot take it out. Um, but there are some really spectacular pieces to be seen. Those of you who like to hike or bike in the preserve, if you've been around Cerro del Medio Loop, that goes through what's known as Obsidian Valley. And there's a stretch there that it looks like it's paved with obsidian. There is so much on the ground, some of the biggest chunks you will ever see. Um, and so this type of resource, as I say, is one of the reasons why Native Americans were attracted to the region. Um, the other thing that's really cool about um, the preserve's um, native ties and history um, are what are known as the field houses in the Banco Bonito area. Um, and these seem to have been one, possible, sometimes two, but generally one room square structures that were built for seasonal farming. Um, this appears to have started sometime in the late 14th century, early 15th century, as the population of native peoples increased after the collapse of Chaco Canyon um, further to the west. Um, and uh, so if you, again, if you know what you're looking for, you can make out some of these ruins at the picture on the right, the remains of um, uh, the foundations of the walls. Um, and it's the it's currently the highest known elevation of farming that we have discovered. You know, it's above it's well above eight thousand feet. And again, very very short growing season, but it's a testament to the ingenuity of Native American agricultural practices that they were able to pull this off. Um, because really, after that, there is not a lot of um, agriculture happening in the preserve. Um, and so this is just one of the many examples of you know the clear ties to the native peoples of the southwest currently the preserve i think has mapped about 30 percent of all archaeological sites um, within the preserve they've got a lot more work to do um, but the but what they're finding is really pretty spectacular and there's more and more that's coming out about it um, but that kind of gets us then to the historical era. And, and really what characterizes the historical era is ranching, um, first with sheep and then ultimately with cattle. Um, you know, of course, the Spanish were present in New Mexico from the 1500s onward. Um, the earliest documentation we have of Spanish knowledge of the area, um, we believe that a party tied to Oñate and his settlement uh, outside Española may have passed through as early as the 16th century on their way westward, exploring further areas. Um, but the earliest mention we have on a map is from this 1779 map by Bernardo de Miera y Pacheco. Um, and you can see it circled here, the Valle de los Vacas, um, which means Valley of the Cows. Um, and you can see San Ildefonso, Tezuque, Nambe, uh, Santa Fe is just down here. Um, and so uh, 
the Spanish certainly were aware of it, um, but again, because of difficulties of access, um, there doesn't seem to have been a whole lot of ranching, if any, um, until well into the 19th century. It was just simply too difficult to get up there, um, you know, even in the summer season, uh, and then it was too difficult to get your animals out. Um, the, the frosts um, could be extremely deadly to your herds. Uh, and then of course, um, you know, life was not always peaceful uh, with uh, the relationship between the Spaniards, Spanish settlements and native tribes, and that was a risk as well. Um, so it's not really until the 19th, late, mid to late, late 19th century that this comes together as a, as a sort of privately held territory. Um, and it actually originates in a land grant in Las Vegas in 18, 1821, uh, Las Vegas, New Mexico, of course. Um, this was right at the end of Spanish control of the area as Mexico was gaining its independence, right at the end of the, Mex um, the, the war for independence with Spain. And a, a, a longtime New Mexico family, the Cabeza de Vaca family, were granted half a million acres around what is now Las Vegas, New Mexico, um, in a royal Spanish land grant. They were never able to really hold that. They had some temporary settlements. Um, well, uh, structures, I should say, um, shelters for raising sheep. They were never able to do a whole lot because at that, at that time, um, that was absolutely sort of unknown territory in terms of, you know, not any, nobody really controlled that area. You had illegal trappers coming in from America and Canada. You had, you know, um, raids by some of the Plains tribes. And so they were never really able to develop it, have permanent settlement, you know, expand their herds in any way. Um, and so by 1830, at which time New Mexico was under Mexican control, um, a competing land grant was actually granted to a group of people who had originated basically as squatters on the Cabeza de Vaca family's land grant and who had subsequently founded the town of Las Vegas. And the, uh, the government of Mexico thought that the, the Vaca family had abandoned it. And so they granted the land to um, the settlers and that gradually developed into the town of Las Vegas. Now, the Cabeza de Vaca family is not happy about that because they intended to keep it, um, but more international inter uh, events intervened in the form of the Mexican-American War. Um, and so they weren't able to press their claim because they were too busy watching New Mexico get invaded by the American army. Um, and so when the Mexican-American War was over in 1848, um, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo required the United States government to review all of the land grants of the of what had been granted by Spain and Mexico um, and decide whether these were valid. And so that's what the Cabeza de Vaca family you know, took their claim to court with the US Surveyor General. Um, and in 1860, you know, they looked at both grants and the, and the territorial government was like, well, they're both valid, but we can't exactly move Las Vegas. That had by that point become quite a thriving town. And so the Vaca family was offered their pick of 500,000 acres anywhere in uh, 100,000 acre parcels anywhere in New Mexico territory, which at that time included Arizona and a good portion of southern Colorado. And so their very first choice, what becomes known as Vaca location number one, is of course now the Vias Caldera. Um, the other, there were two, um, the other two parcels were in um, Arizona, one was in Southern Colorado, and then um, the fourth uh, or fifth additional one was near what is now Tucumcari. The lawyer that they hired to press their claim with the US government ended up getting paid in all four of those other parcels, but they did get to keep this 100,000 acre parcel. Um, and they used it primarily for um, sheep herding. Um, and so the way that Spanish and Mexican or New Mexican um, land grants worked was that the land was held in common. Um, and so it was granted to families or communities and then their descendants. And so as the generations went on, you know, the shares that a person held would get divided and subdivided and even further subdivided among all of their heirs. And so by the late 19th century, by the time that the Cabeza de Vaca family had this, um, were able to choose this, there were dozens, if not more than a hundred um, uh, shareholders in the property. And I think by the time it ultimately passed into a different family's hands, it was well in almost like 200 people, I think. It, Craig Martin in his book has like exhaustively looked at how many pieces of shares there were, and it just goes on and on and on. Um, 
but anyway, so they're, they, they are allowed to choose this parcel. They pick this parcel. Um, and in 1876, the US Surveyor General surveys it formally and they managed to do it in four days. And 100,000 acres in four days is pretty impressive, especially when you consider the landscape that we're talking about. And so it was clearly a bodge job. Um, and they actually shorted it by about 10,000 acres. Um, but ultimately that does get uh, corrected. But effectively the Bacas get 100,000 acres and they use it as New Mexican families had used land grants for centuries at this point, sharing it among their family members you know, with access to resources and sheep. Um, the issue with that, though, um, becomes a really big deal by the late 19th century um, because of the, the difference in uh, ownership, uh, the understanding of ownership under the law of American law versus Mexican and Spanish law. As I mentioned, Mexican and Spanish law saw it as you know, communal property, whereas American law property is individually owned. And so once New Mexico had sort of settled down into its territorial status, you had a major influx of people from back east looking to get some land in New Mexico. And unfortunately, because of that difference in law, that exposed um, New Mexican families to a lot of swindles. Um, and many, many families were swindled out of their land, in part because most of them did not speak English, certainly did not understand you know, what American law was saying. Um, and so many land grants passed into the hands of um, Anglos from back east, one of whom was Thomas Catron, sort of the leading land shark uh, lawyer. He was also part of the Santa Fe Ring. Some of you may be familiar with that whole political group. Um, and it was all, and it was also spearheaded by some of the leading Hispanic families in New Mexico who wanted to add to their property. And one of them was this man, Mariano Otero, and he was very much from, you know, one of the absolute most prestigious families in New Mexico. He teamed up with Catron to um, acquire quite a few grants, um, the Baca grant in particular, he had his eye on that for a while. Um, and there were a lot of really serious shenanigans that went on that ultimately led to Otero gaining control of this. And I like I don't don't exaggerate. There were midnight shootouts, you know, surreptitious escapes. There were shell companies, and there were lawyers from the same uh, law firm representing both sides of it. And it, it just it was a huge mess. Um, but ultimately, Otero does succeed in acquiring the land for his family, um, and he continues the practice of raising sheep, but he does it in basically what we would understand as sort of a sharecropping fashion, where um, you know local shepherds who are in who want to be able to graze on the land can do so, um, but they have to pay him for the privilege and then they also have to um, uh, graze uh, or take care of his sheep as well um, and then uh, you know purchase supplies from him. Um, this was becoming very common as American law kind of took hold uh, in the late 19th century. Um, and so uh, that the whole idea of sort of communal use of resources really begins to shift. Um, he's also interested in exploiting some of the other resources. Um, he was very much an entrepreneur um, and uh, saw the possibilities for tourism uh, in um, uh, particularly the Western side. Um, in the Sulphur Springs area that I mentioned where you can see some of the fumaroles, um, he had uh, grand plans for a hotel and what we might call a wellness spa um, and ultimately shifted that towards sulfur mining, which I'll talk about later. Um, he did have a hand in encouraging Hamas Springs to develop, which did, of course, become sort of a, a you know, a spa resort town. Um, and he even convinced the Santa Fe business community to um, help him finance and improve the wagon trail from Santa Fe up to Valle Grande by basically financing all but the last two miles himself, because he was concerned with being able to get his, his livestock out of the mountains in time and then to, down to the railroad so he could ship it out to markets. Um, but ultimately, um, some of the Otero's um, you know, legal dealings start to catch up with them. And by the early 1900s, the Otero family is in some financial difficulty because they spent so much time in court battling other uh, communities for control of some of their grants, among other things, um, that in 1909, they decide to sell. Um, and they, they sell it to a company out of Pennsylvania known as Redondo Development Company. Um, and they sell it for um, $300,000 in 1909, which is a huge amount of money. 
Uh, it was actually about six times the actual market value. Um, and so I don't know what they did to get that kind of cash, but it was probably something shady, but ultimately they were able to walk away um, with a fair amount of money in their pocket. Um, they do continue, however, to lease grazing rights from Redondo, um, but with it, within a few years, they decide that they're kind of not interested in doing that anymore. And so they decide not to renew their grazing lease. Um, and so uh, a, a pair of brothers out of Española, Frank and George Bond, uh, Frank on the other side of your screen, uh, who ran a, a rather successful mercantile business in Española, um, find out that the grazing rights are available. And so they approach Redondo Development Company to take over the lease. And so they begin grazing, um, but they would they very much would like to own the property. And so um, in 1917, they start grazing. Uh, and by 1918, excuse me, they have purchased the, pro the property from Redondo Development Company, except for the timber rights. Uh, Redondo retains a 99 year lease on that um, and 50% uh, of the mineral rights as well. And that becomes an issue a little further into the 20th century. But beyond that, the bonds are now the full owners of, of the property. Um, and so they begin to uh, increase um, some of the cows. The Oteros had added cows um, around this, the turn of the century. Um, they were running about 20,000 head of sheep and about 3,000 head of cows, which is way more than the land could support. Um, the uh, bonds continue to expand the herds, um, ultimately reaching about 12,000 head of cattle as they start to reduce sheep um, towards uh, the middle of the 1900s. Um, but they're very interested uh, in uh, expanding this, the, this ranching operation. Um, and they start shifting away even further from sort of the sharecropping model. Um, and by the 1930s, early 1940s, they're beginning to hire professional cowboys um, and moving away from um, sheep grazing almost exclusively. Um, so as I said, they're the ones who really increase uh, cattle to some degree, um, but it's really not until after the war, World War II, um, that cattle become really viable because um, it's not until the 1930s that New Mexico 4 is anything really more than the road that Otero had improved. Um, it, the CCC, as part of the work during the Great Depression, um, makes this makes commercial trucking basically possible for the first time once we build that highway. And so any cows and sheep that were coming into the Valle for the season had to be driven in, you know, in old fashioned cattle drives and sheep drives. Um, I love this picture. This is from a 1921 roundup shortly after the bonds had purchased the property um, uh, where they were um, uh, branding cattle um, at the beginning, at the end of the season. But they're still, you know, largely focused on wool well into the 30s. As I say, this is a 1936 wool haul that came out of the Hamas Mountains down to, uh, that was brought down to the rail yards in Albuquerque. Um, but as I mentioned, um, by the 1940s and with the end of World War II, um, you know, improved uh, vehicles for uh, for trucking and then improved roads allows for um, cattle to be really more financially viable um, than sheep. The other reason, of course, was that at the end of World War II, the bottom dropped out of the, of the wool market um, because synthetic materials had been introduced after the war and Americans were just, you know, they had a much greater appetite for beef than they did for sheep. Um, and so they still have a few sheep um, on the preserve into the 1950s, but really the focus becomes cattle. Um, and as I said, um, by the 1950s, we have almost 12,000 head of cows. Um, 1948 was the last cattle drive into the Valle Grande. After that, they were all shipped out. I think this was shot coming through um, Rito de los Indios. If anybody uh, watching this has been up that trail, that actually goes up to the northeastern boundary of the preserve and connects to um, uh, Forest Road 144 that goes down to Española, which we know that the bonds use to access the preserve. So I think this is where the cows were coming through. Um, but as it is, this is the very last time they were uh, they were driven in, you know, over the hills in the traditional fashion, and then after that they were only uh, shipped out by by um, uh, truck. Um, so the bonds held the property uh, until uh, uh, basically 1957, uh, which by that point, um, both Frank and George Bond were dead, as was Franklin Bond, Frank's son, who had taken over ranching operations. Um, and so in 1957, it became known that the bonds were looking for a buyer um, because they decided it was just time to get out of it. Ethel Bond um, was the widow and she just was not interested in trying to maintain the land anymore. The family had largely moved to um, Albuquerque and then even um, there was a, a branch of the family in California. And so it was, it was just time to get out. 
Um, and so at that point, there was a real push and a real interest to turn this into public lands, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. Um, but uh, for a number of reasons, partially due to bureaucratic infighting, it was not possible to make for you know the Forest Service or the national parks to purchase it at the time. Um, Sam and Bruce King, Bruce King ultimately becoming New Mexico governor, I think four times, um, wanted to buy it, but they didn't have enough money to buy all of it. And so uh, the bonds wouldn't partition it. And so the King brothers were not able to buy it. And ultimately, an oil man from Texas by the name of Pat Dunnigan um, purchased it uh, from the bonds uh, in the late, and late 1961, beginning of 1962, for two and a half million dollars. And there was a real sense of dismay locally about this because people were worried, you know, you know, the, the terrible stereotype of Texas oil man, like what's going to happen? There's going to be, you know, all these exclusive luxury resorts and no one's going to have access to it. And so there, there was some real concern about it. Um, you know, particularly when fences went up and 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 people uh, really just felt that you know this this chance of having access has disappeared yet again. Um, but Dunnigan was really interesting. He was not what people thought. You know, he responded to that public outcry. You know, he had, had thought about possibly having a resort, and he backed off from that. He was very interested in diversification, um, and he wanted to modernize some of the the um, uh, rain, the ranching practices. He was concerned about all the overgrazing that had happened, and so he reduced the size of the herd to about 8,000 head of cattle, ultimately bringing it down to just 4,000 head of cattle, which was not very much. Um, he also uh, worked with the Forest Service um, to reintroduce elk to the mountains because they had been uh, hunted to extinction. Uh, and of course, now the Valle is famous for its elk herd. Um, and he uh, also, uh, as I said, introduced new sort of uh, conservation practices. He was interested in um, uh, planting uh, uh, grasses that would help the land recover. Um, he uh, even looked into um, uh, raising racehorses at high altitude, you know, possibly like, you know, marathon runners training at high elevation. Um, he looked into that for a little while. Um, he did some uh, energy exploration on geothermal, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, and he also was the one who started, you know, Hollywood's interest in the area um, and, you know, many, uh, many films, TV shows, you know, to the present day uh, were shot uh, in the Valle and around the Valle, starting under the Donegan area uh, era. So we really have him to thank for a lot of the um, uh, improvements in the land and ra uh, ranching practices. Um, and he really did make a big effort to try to, um, uh, to help the land heal. One of the biggest things that we owe him is the um, ending of uh, timbering on the land. Um, because by the time that Dunnigan bought the land, um, logging had just ramped up immensely. And this goes back to that issue of the separation of timber rights. Um, because in the West, just because you own the land doesn't mean you owned everything under it and everything on it. And so Dunnigan purchased what the bonds had owned, um, but as we know, they did not own the timber rights. And so until the 1930s and when New Mexico 4 was built, logging like on a grand scale was really not commercially viable. And so um, from the time of the bond purchase in 1918 to when Dunnigan bought it in 1961-62, only about 25,000 acres of land had been logged and that was largely in the Northwest corner. But once that highway was there, you could now get logs to market a lot more quickly. Um, and so basically from the day that Dunnigan bought it, he was in court with um, what was now Fire Steel Lumber Company, trying to get them to stop what were increasingly destructive lo um, logging practices. What you see here in this picture is a satellite photo from um, right around the time Dunnigan finally won the court battle. Um, and these are some of the more than, uh, more than a thousand miles of timber roads located in the preserve that were scraped in the landscape by the timbering company. Um, and you can see on this one that some of them are really quite close. And in the final years of logging, when the timber company saw the writing on the wall and knew that Dunnigan was, was gaining the upper hand in court, they practiced what was called um, cable logging, where they drove two trucks in parallel, one on one road and one on the other road with a cable between them, and they would just rip out the trees that they drove past. And you can imagine what that does for erosion. Um, you know, slash piles are a huge fire danger. It was just a mess. And Dunnigan was absolutely appalled with it. And so the battle went back and forth in court. You can see here, this is a picture from the 1930s when um, uh, uh, t uh, logging was beginning to ramp up in terms of its commercial viability, the size of some of the trees they were pulling out. Um, but so by the time that Dunnigan finally won, um, uh, 
uh, it was in 1972, he ultimately settled with the, the timber company uh, for $1.25 million, which was half what he paid for the property itself. Um, and so, but at that point then, that meant that these logging practices would come to a halt. Um, and after that, he set about working on some of uh, the rest, forest restoration uh, and worked with the Forest Service uh, as well as other people trying to um, make some improvements to what had been done to his land. Um, some of the other resource exploitation that was done historically, as I mentioned, um, the Oteros were interested in um, sulfur mining, um, sort of going back to the Otero era. Uh, in that sulfur canyon um, area, um, they did, uh, as I said, attempt a, a, a wellness spa. It didn't really last, but then they focused on mining the sulfur itself. It was very good quality, but it, there wasn't a lot of it. Um, although in about three years, they managed to extract 200,000 pounds um, by 1909, which is pretty impressive given what they were, you know, the technology that they had, um, but it was played out very quickly. It just didn't go down very deep. So it was ultimately abandoned. Um, and this little pocket was a private inholding until just last year. And that was a hangover from that messed up survey back in 1876. Um, this had been, uh, somebody else had been able to take a homestead on it and then ultimately it was seen as um, outside the boundary, but actually inside the boundary. And the, and the preserve management did manage to, along with the National Park Trust, purchase this land. So it's now definitely within the preserve itself. Um, but it was also in this area uh, that uh, Dunnigan did some of his other diversification, which was geothermal exploration. Um, he knew that there was you know, geothermal activity um, on the Western side, um, you know, using steam for um, commercial power production um, was gaining uh, interest, certainly by the 1970s when we had the oil shortages, the oil embargoes. Um, and so he teamed up with Union Oil and p and um, to dig a bunch of exploratory or drill a bunch of exploratory wells um, really through the 1970s, um, but it was not a, a pressure um, that was going to be commercially viable. So that was ultimately abandoned. Um, but Lanel and the DOE did some further scientific exploration well into the 80s. Um, and this picture uh, taken by Fraser Goff for a Lanel report is one of the lab wells that was drilled uh, in the area of Sulphur Creek and you can see it going off. Uh, the picture on the other side is that same well today. And this well is actually live. If you go up to it, it's hot and it's hissing. Um, I don't. I have not tried to open it. I don't want to do that. <laughs> um, but it is. It, it is still there, which is kind of cool. So you can hike up through here on the west side and, and go through this area where they were doing some of this exploration. Ultimately, these efforts were abandoned, as I said, because they weren't commercially viable. And then they got what they wanted scientifically out of it. And then that was that. Um, the other thing, of course, that the Valle is famous for and has, you know, has been used for for a really long time is outdoor recreation. Um, you know, as far back as the Bond, um, they had an excellent relationship with the Los Alamos Boys School. This picture here is a, a Los Alamos Boys School camping trip to the Valle. Um, to the, this day, of course, the caldera is famous for its excellent fishing. Um, you can see the cats that they that they managed to get uh, in this picture, which I particularly like. Um, and then camping as well. Um, uh, one of the uh, head cowboys uh, on, on the bonds that they had employed, Ted Mather, ultimately became the head wrangler at the boys' school. Um, and so he led quite a few um, up to three week camping trips um, of the boys' school before the war into the Valle. And this picture, um, they're at their mess up in Grito de los Indios camp up in the northeast corner of, of the preserve. Um, and so the recreation opportunities, of course, were well known in the area. And that was part of the public interest in hopefully getting this to be public land someday. Uh, and that was also what sort of uh, led the push in the 1960s that of course then again managed to get the land uh, before the, the, the government got its act together. Um, and these days, of course, now that it is public, uh, public land, the hiking is fantastic. That's my personal favorite. Um, that's the book I wrote with the hiking trails. Um, and then of course, mountain biking, um, horseback riding, Hunting continues um, as part of sort of the multi-use history of the land. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's an incredible resource um, be, be just for outdoor enthusiasts, uh, much less for the beauty of the landscape and then some of its, its you know, cultural and geologic history. Um, but as I said, that interest in, you know, access to this spectacular area was what drove the push for this to become public lands. And actually, as far back as the early 1900s, um, before the Bonds even bought it, um, there was a, a push to create a vast um, national park 
including what is now Bandelier, basically all of the Jemez Mountains, as well as the Valles Caldera. Um, and ultimately that didn't happen, but we did get Bandelier National Monument out of it in 1916. And in 1960, there was a renewed push, as I said, um, but Dunnigan himself, even though he was the private landowner, he actually really wanted this to be public land eventually. Uh, in fact, in 1975, he teamed up with the Park Service to have it declared a national natural landmark, which would uh, enable um, some long-term preservation of biological and ecological resources. And so he was already thinking about this. Um, but in 1980, he died suddenly of a heart attack. Um, and at that point, everybody was really worried, like, now what's going to happen? Is it just going to stay in private hands forever? And um, so there was sort of a buildup of public interest, lots of different groups, hunters, environmentalists, locals, national interests began to develop. I mean, it, ranchers, you name it, people really started getting on board. There was renewed interest in the Park Service. The Forest Service was interested in it. And while Dunnigan's sons and heirs didn't want to sell right away, gradually they did start moving towards trying to fulfill Pat Dunnigan's ultimate wish. And by the late 1990s, they approached Washington and said that they might be interested in, in having this become public land. And so then you get even more national attention. If you do a Google search, there's articles in the New York Times about it. I mean, it, it just, it became this huge, huge focus. Um, and it took a long time for the wheels of bureaucracy to sort of sort themselves out, but ultimately, um, at the very, uh, in, in 2000, uh, this was uh, signed into law and it became the Valles Caldera National Trust. Um, you and I uh, purchased it for $101 million. It was 100,000, well, just shy of 100,000 acres. We bought it for about $1,000 an acre, which is not very much money when you think about it. Um, so this image, uh, the one side, the 1964 um, National Park Service proposal, there was this idea that it could join up with Bandelier National Monument and become sort of this joint, uh, you know, corridor of National Park, National Monument, you know, protected lands. Um, but ultimately, as I say, it, it, it begins as a trust. And the reason it began as a trust um, is because um, there, there were a number of concerns. One was, um, you know, preserving that multi-use history of the land, you know, for access to ranching and hunting and, and hiking and that sort of thing. Um, and the other concern was, was finances, basically. Um, and the two senators at the time, um, Jeff Bingaman and Pete Domenici, were working on, you know, negotiating this through Congress. And Domenici in particular was worried, A, about is this going to be able to support itself? And B, the US government already owns a ton of land in New Mexico. And so he wasn't totally on board with a whole bunch more. Um, and so the idea was that instead of just being a full on park or preserve or you know, full on federal lands, it would be this experiment in land management of a trust, nine appointees, five of whom had to live in New Mexico, and it had to be financially viable within 15 years. And Domenici thought that, you know, with uh, fees from, you know, allowing rain, uh, ranchers to graze, uh, you know, maybe some limited logging permits, and then certainly, you know, recreational access permits, hunting permits, other things that that might actually make this possible. And so that sort of structure was what got him on board and ultimately enabled this to happen. Now, the problem is we're a really remote state. We're a very small population access here is exceedingly difficult. And then you have you know, several appointees who are not from New Mexico, who don't really get how New Mexico works. It's not the best setup. And, the, the, and to, to be fair, the trustees did their best. They did everything they possibly could to come up with ways of making money and make this financially viable, but this was gonna be a real challenge. Um, but in doing this, this is, the public, this is the protected lands that we got. Um, and so if you look on here, the pink here, this is now obviously um, the Valles Caldera National Preserve. When this became, uh, when this came under the trust, this corner um, was, became part of Bandelier. This was actually the Upper Frijoles watershed. Um, and so that is under Bandelier management at this point. This area is our ski hill. Dunnigan had sold this to the Los Alamos Ski Club back in 75 so they could run their lift to the top of um, the mountain um, so that we could uh, have, have better skiing. And then this area, when this became on the trust, this was ceded to Santa Clara Pueblo because this is the headwaters of some of the waters that goes through their land. And so it's, it's sacred to the Pueblo. So that was handed off to them. But otherwise, you have this effectively 
the Baca location. And it's still marked that way on maps. Um, and so the, the managed land now is about 89,000 acres, but the land itself is still basically protected from the way that it was it originated in its 100,000 acre form. And then all this green area around it is also forest service lands. And so we have this vast area of protected lands, which is also why the wildlife is in such great shape in the area. Um, but as I mentioned, the trust was really going to struggle um, in terms of becoming financially viable. And so in addition to the, the issues I already raised in terms of being remote, not having a lot of access, you know, not having a big population, there was a lot of work to be done. Um, huge amounts of work in terms of restoring the forests that had been destroyed by logging. And then you have drought and wildfires on top of it. This is the Thompson Ridge fire from 2013, um, which came very close to wiping out the historic cabin district. Um, the Los Conscious fire ravaged the southern portion of it. Um, you know, there's miles and miles and miles and miles and miles of barbed wire fence to be pulled out. There's infrastructure to be done, um, not to mention mapping and improving access and all this other stuff. And so it became increasingly clear as the 15 year time frame was coming to a close that this was just not going to work. And so there was a renewed push for this to come under the, um, uh, the management of the National Park Service. Um, and so it took a, another round of negotiations in Congress, um, you know, and a lot of local um, support, local action. A citizens group known as Caldera Action really kind of led the charge to bring this under the National Park Service um, for a better funding stream, which I know is funny because the Park Service doesn't have a lot of money, but it was better than what um, the trust was able to access. And so the very end of 2014, um, uh, management of the preserve was passed over to uh, the Park Service from the trust. The trust was dissolved. Um, and then in October of 2015, there was a formal celebration in the Valle Grande. You can see it there in the background, recognizing that this was now part of the Park Service. Um, and then moving forward, it would be uh, managed by them. And what's interesting now is that old dream of the Valle being also under like part of an extended park connected to Bandelier in some ways is actually happening because now there's sort of joint management between the two superintendents that are working in, co uh, in coordination just in this past year. So some of those you know, long standing goals are finally coming together um, and the park service is working really hard to improve things on the preserve. There is a long way to go, um, but, th but things are beginning to, to move a little bit. Um, so the important thing that I always like to tell everybody is it belongs to us. This is our land now. And so it's an incredible resource. If you haven't been up there to experience the beauty of it, to you know, just sit in its great beautiful valleys, to go hiking or biking or fishing, or just, as I say, you know, look at, at the beautiful elk herds. It's really a spectacular place. Um, I'd like to thank, uh, you know, Fraser Goff, Craig Martin, Kurt Anschutz, and Thomas Merlin for a lot of the information that I've presented here. And then I have a huge debt to the Los Alamos Historical Society um, and Sandoval County Historical Society in particular for providing me with a lot of these photos. Um, so I know that was a lot. Um, there's so much more. So um, I'm excited to take questions and talk about this further. So I appreciate everyone for coming and listening. Um, and I will stop screen sharing and hand it over to Amy. Thanks so much. That was so fascinating. I think we've got lots of interesting little hooks that people might have questions about. So if you have questions, um, please put them in the chat. Again, probably a button at the top or the bottom of your screen, depending on your device, maybe on the sides, on mobile. It, it, uh, uh, type the question in the chat. I'll read it out and, and we can talk about it. Um, while you all are thinking of questions and putting them in the chat, um, I can get us started, especially since you know the trails so well. If you could recommend a couple of trails, one trail, a couple of trails that you like people could go on and maybe see some connections to some of the history that you've introduced us to. Um, what well, trails would you them, recommend? Uh, well, just uh, not even needing trails, but just to drive to is the um, historic cabin district. Excuse me. Um, it's just a couple miles past the visitor center. Um, you do need a backcountry permit to go there, um, but it's right at the base of Redondo Mountain. And as I said, you know. Thompson Ridge Fire managed to not destroy those cabins through the heroic efforts of the firefighters. Um, and those date back to the early Bond area, uh, era. I think the oldest one is 1914, 1916. So actually that's still, um, it's not quite the Bonds. Um, and then the latest one is the 1960s. Um, for people who are you know, um, uh, fans of Longmire, uh, you may know one of those cabins as Walt's Cabin. Um, that was actually a working cabin. It was the ranch foreman's cabin. That's from the Bond era too. Um, so that's a great, you know, just you know, see some of the more recent history. Um, 
but uh, certainly um, I think if you go up um, Northwest Corner um, Trail, that's a really nice one. It's beautiful um, and it's, it's really nice right now because it's great for Aspen, um, but there's some um, uh, remnants of some of the early sawmills that are back there. Um, and then the Rito de los Indios Trail, um, among others in the Northeast Corner, um, as well as um, uh, Cerro del Medio Trail has a bunch of really great dendroglyphs, which are carvings on the aspen from the various sheep herders and cowboys who were in sheep camps and cow camps during the season. Um, and there's there's a whole ton of them scattered throughout the preserve, but those particular areas are good places to see them. So that's kind of that's kind of cool. Um, San Antonio Trail Mountain Trail also terminates just past an old fence crew cabin um, where people uh, stayed, uh, you know, while they were working on the fence line for the western side of the of, of the property. So, so those are some good ones. But if you if you're paying attention, you can certainly see a lot of stuff like the Obsidian Trails, the Obsidian Valley, which is on Cerro del Medio, as I say, is a great source for that. Banco Bonito, if you know what you're looking for, you can see some of those uh, field houses, which is kind of cool. So. Depends on what you're looking for, but there's a lot there. That's awesome. Yeah, it's great. That there's there's so much that you can like get, mm -hmm. get access to. Even yeah, that's great. I'm not seeing any questions. Yeah, and I I, I shouldn't limit it just to questions, comments, anything else that is sparked uh, from from this presentation. Please feel free to share um, in the chat. Um, and I know I went a little long too, but I get excited talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. I I thought it was really interesting. It's really some fascinating history and so much we were talking before we got started geologic history it kind of takes this is a long that span a while, yeah. of time that we're talking about um i'm going to potentially um gotta gotta thank you for the talk in the, in the chat um potentially put you on the spot um so if you don't if this isn't something that you you ran across in the books just just say so but um was there any women's history in any of the eras because so much of this is men that are taking up sheep or men that are taking up cows or men that are binding land and there had to have been women uh, involved yeah uh, well certainly ethel bond um was was very much you know integral to um the bonds operations she was very much present in that um there and i'm the name is escaping me now but there was a family uh and uh, in the early 1900s into the Bond era who had um, a tiny uh, homestead uh, as part of the disputed um, uh, land uh, on the Eastern side. Um, and she, I, I believe that the husband worked in the cow camps for the Bonds and she was kind of left all her own um, mm -hmm. you know, with a couple kids in the you know, very remote cabin on the Eastern side. And I, I can't, I'm sorry, I don't remember her name. Um, and it, they only managed to scratch out a living up there for a couple of years and ultimately abandoned the, the farmstead because they just weren't able to do much. But apparently the land was excellent for growing potatoes and they produced some of the crazy hundreds of, you know, tons of potatoes um, in the time that they were there. But that was about it. And, you know, um, homesteading required that you make improvements on the land, et cetera, et cetera. And they just weren't able to do it. So I've seen her uh, name and there was another there was another woman who was the wife of one of the cow hands in the Bond era. And reading between the lines, I think she just didn't put up with a whole lot, but historically she's recorded as being a little um, wild um, and drinking too much. And I don't know if that's true or not. I think she just didn't put up with a bunch of cowboys. Um, <laughs> and so she apparently was required to live in a cabin further out from the main camp because nobody left her. <laughs> and again, I don't, I don't remember what her name was either, but there's, unfortunately, there's just, there's not a lot of women who get mentioned. Um, you know, certainly they were there, but it was, it was, it was rough. It was rough country. Um, and so it, it would have been kind of tough. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's not, not an uncommon history when you're looking at sort of 18th century, right. 19th century, getting into the records as a woman is sort right. of yeah. Remarkable. And I guess as a side note, you know, of the Oteros, um, Nina Otero Warren ended up being really significant and she helped start public education in New Mexico. And so, you know, she's a branch of the Otero family. I have not seen that she had any direct ties to the, the Valle personally, but I think, you know, she at least, you know, we see her, but it's, it's right. men's history, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's see, we've got um, somebody saying we enjoyed um, Coyote Call Trail numerous times before it burned. I hope many were able to as well. Um, someone's asking, are there any further development plans for the preserve? Um, so the 
when the park uh, or when the preserve came under the National Park Service in 2018, the superintendent issued what's called the um, foundation document, which you, is available um, uh, to the public. You just I just Google it um, for the preserve. It's a PDF, and you can see basically sort of all of the things listed out that need to happen, all of the challenges, you know, the um, constituents, and you know, including native native tribes in the community, um, you know, the various things that they're looking for down the line. Some of these are small, some of these are massive. They're going to take a long time. They're going to take a lot of funding. Um, and just this last spring, um, the preserve uh, had sort of a public comment period about how different areas of the preserve are going to be um, uh, sort of managed in terms of front country, back country, that kind of thing. So there's a lot that's in the works that's being talked about. But, you know, as we know, the Park Service is woefully behind on all sorts of infrastructure work all the way, you know, across the United States. Um, and then you know, the preserve itself just has a huge amount of work to do. Um, and it's a struggle to get staff. Um, so there's a lot of things planned, but time frame is huge. I mean, from the very beginning, for example, in 2000, when it came under the trust, Dorothy Horde had led the charge for um, a, a rim trail. Um, and I know Craig Martin, I think, was involved in that and a lot of other people, too. And that's part of the legislation. Like, that is a required thing to have someday. Um, and it's nowhere near even starting. <laughs> so, um, you know, and here we are 21 years later. So uh, it's. Uh, there's there's a lot that everybody would like to see that people know needs to happen, but it's it's just going to take a while. So, um, let's see. Someone's asking, um, were the roads on Cerro Rubio built for logging? Yeah, basically all the trails in the preserve. Um, well, not all of them, but I would ninety nine point eight percent of them are all uh, timber roads. Um, and so anytime you see any of that, that's that's going to be um, largely timber roads. There may be a handful here and there that um, the Dunnigans might have used, um, but there's not real good documentation of that. And so the vast majority of what you see, especially because they're all pretty much the same width, are going to be timber roads. So. And that's one of the things that makes hiking and biking in there kind of challenging is because, you know, there's there's so many different paths. It's very easy to get confused. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, how well have the reforestation efforts succeeded? Um, so, so. <laughs> um, there, I would say there's actually a lot more um, managed controlled burning ha and thinning happening. Um, one of the problems was, um, you know, Dunnigan didn't get control of the timber rights until 72, um, and he was dead eight years later. And so there was only so much that could happen. Um, and so, unfortunately, a lot of the areas that were logged so heavily were allowed to grow back all at once. And so all the trees were largely the same diameter. It was, you know, all the same species, really, really dense. And then you put New Mexico's drought on top of it, and it was a fire waiting to happen. And so that's in part why some of the, the fires on the eastern side were so catastrophic. Um, but the both the trust and um, and the Park Service now are, are trying really hard to work on thinning and, and better management. Um, there were they did a couple controlled burns this last winter. Um, most of the work has been sort of on the western side of the preserve. Like if you go out to the Banco Bonito area, that's actually a really relatively healthy forest. You can see, you know, the Ponderosa are separated. There's not a lot of undergrowth. Um, it's kind of what it should look like. But there's a lot of areas that still need that kind of work. So it's they're working on it. Um, reforestation and the areas that have burned is largely right now being allowed to just grow back on its own, in part because some of those fires, like Los Conchas in particular, was so hot that it sterilized the soil. Um, there's a, in, you know, as another example of that, um, as a side note, obsidian has a very high water content. And under the right conditions in, in a forest fire, the water actually boils off and leaves behind what looks like pumice, but it's actually the glass crystals of obsidian. And we found pieces of that from where it went through Los Conchas and like sort of the Rabbit Ridge area. Um, and so a lot has been allowed to come back just to allow the soil to replenish itself. Um, and then I think, you know, further down the line, more um, managed reforestation efforts are, are planned, but I'm not an arborist, so I don't know when that's going to happen. <laughs> um, there's a kind of related question um, about how much of the preserve is forested, since you know, so much of it, like there's not the trees in the 
the bowl you know, or the I don't know that percentage. Um, it's a good chunk, uh, especially um, the Western half, because that has not suffered fire as much. Um, you know, the flip side that it's a fire waiting to happen. Um, but I, I don't know the percentage, unfortunately. Sorry. Sure. <laughs> um, there's some more thanks uh, for a, a great talk. Um, somebody saying that another great thing you're you know, talking about all the activities to do up there, mm -hmm. <coughs> excuse me, um, is cross country skiing in the valley. Yeah, snowshoeing um, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then uh, we've got a question. What is, if you know the history of the term Los Indios? You know, I don't know. Um, there's a lot, a lot, there's a, there was a lot of, um, trapping and mining and timbering in the area and then some of these you know, some of these names go back to trails that were used by um you know uh small time shepherds you know during the um mexican period and then into the territorial period um and so i you know some of those may just have come out of um convention and that people got used to calling a certain area something but i don't know specifics on any of these um and, and why they ended up with that name like Cerro del Abrigo, Abrigo means jacket. Like, why is it called that? I don't know. Um, uh, you know, El Cajete, which is more of a bowl, that makes a little more sense because it translates that way. It's also, for those of you who know, a rather unfortunate Spanish slang, which I will leave out, but um, it means a bowl. Um, Caldera means a bowl, but some of these trail, I don't, I, they may have been lost to history and I haven't come across an explanation for the names, so. Yeah, it seems like the sort of thing that uh, I would expect us to be lucky to find in any sort of yeah. documentary record. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, oral tradition makes a lot of sense. Right. Um, that's, that's the last question that I see. So I'll give people a, a last chance to sort of share thoughts or to ask questions. Um, it's been so interesting. We've covered like so many different <laughs> eras of history. It's such like an interesting lens on this New Mexican history also, because it, it gets into so much of what makes New Mexican history unique. Yeah, and that's that's what I really love about it is you know you you see it as this spectacular landscape, but it it covers everything you know everything that's happened in New Mexico, all the major players, and I mean Catron has a county named after him, Otero has a county named after him, you know Dunnigan was this huge figure, um, and the bond of the bond house is still in Española, it's a museum, you can go visit it, like. There's so much that happened in New Mexico that has some tie to the caldera. That, that's part of what I think is so fascinating. You know, full disclosure, I'm a historian, so like <laughs> that's why I think this is cool. Um, but it's just, it's really neat to see, and it gives us a, a bigger window into where we live and, and what's happened here. Yeah, totally, totally. And um, yeah, I think that really came across in the presentation. So thank you again. Absolutely. Um, there's, there's one question in the chat. Um, if you, any future similar presentations? Yes. Um, do I have the dates with me? Not off the top of my head. Um, but if you're interested in getting, uh, you know, staying in touch um, with what the Historical Society uh, is doing, you can go to losalvoshistory.org and you can see um, what we've got coming up. We've got lectures coming up every month in the fall, um, as well as other events. Um, so losalvoshistory.org slash events is the place to go for that. I'm sorry that I don't have the dates with me. Um, getting some more thanks in in the chat. So I will share that again. Thank you, Coco, for sharing all this. It's so interesting. Um, awesome. And thank you all. Thank you all for showing up. Um, thank you guys I, I really for coming. Appreciate I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. And and again, um, we'll, we'll send, if you're watching this live, we'll send the link out to you. Um, you should get an email from Eventbrite in a couple of days. This is up on YouTube if you'd like to share it. So thank you all so much. Uh, please enjoy the rest of your evenings. Bye, everybody. Thanks.